My next guest is one of Australia's most successful tech entrepreneurs. He invests his own money in early stage companies and he's actually become a very well-known figure as one of the sharks on the television program Shark Tank. It's fair to say his very direct questioning of those seeking to part him from his cash on the show tested even the steeliest of spines. That's what appealed to me about it. He left school at 15 to pursue an apprenticeship in the army, and as I said, he's become one very, very successful man. It's a pleasure to welcome Steve Baxter to Bernardi. Steve, thank you so much for your time. You're probably best known as an investor and a business mentor, but you publicly engage in all manner of subjects from climate change, government, renewable energy, COVID vaccines, right through to transgenderism. I gotta tell you, it's such a rarity to see such direct, and may I say, from my perspective anyway, usually correct public comments from one of our business leaders. Can I ask, what motivates you to engage where others fear to tread? Uh, yeah, g'day, Cor uh, uh, Corey, thanks very much for having me on. Um, look, I, I suppose my life would be a lot simpler if I didn't do it, but um, I think some hills are worth fighting on. Um, we've entered, a, I think, a, a really silly or stupid point in our society where lies are being rewarded and, and people are expected to, to basically disregard objective truths in, in so many areas. Um, and as a dad of three daughters, I'm trying to give them the life skills and the ethics to get through in life. Uh, we, we don't do lies in our house. Um, and so, you know, I just have to sort of stand up and unfortunately sort of say my mind, um, you know, which life would be a lot easier if I didn't, Corey, that's for sure. Yeah, but for many of us, we take heart from that because, um, you know, the more people that are actually speaking up and telling truths to the falsehoods that have been peddled, the better off we're going to be. And one of those areas, of course, is something you've had a lot to say about, and that's um, the future of the electricity supply. Of course, there's a desire to cut carbon dioxide emissions globally. It's driven by an irrational sense that we are destroying the planet, from my perspective. How do you see the moves that the Australian government is pushing, and global governance as well, are going to impact business growth and investment here? And what do you think it's going to mean for consumers in our way of life? Um, well, so far as consumers in our way of life, nothing, nothing good's going to occur from it. Energy underpins every last thing that we do. Um, but you know, I fundamentally think that, that fossil fuels are, are a good for humankind. I mean, I think that the planet Earth is a reasonably inhospitable place for our species to exist, although we do. And we, and we flourish here because of the profligate use and the profligate uh, expenditure of fossil fuels. Ultimately, I don't care what provides my energy, providing it's cheap and reliable. I, I really don't care. Um, but what we're doing right now is not cheap and reliable, and the knock-on cost of that will, will not be pretty, um, to say the least. It's incredible, though. When you outline some very simple consequences of this agenda, you're actually countering a lot of the lies that have been peddled by the left for a very long time. It seems to be much more than just fossil fuels. It's about controlling or wanting to control the economy, have more government interference in it. Uh, it's all done under the guise of saving people. But in reality, if these plans are implemented, the people who are going to feel the pain are all of us. Fewer jobs, less prosperity, higher prices. We're going to be punished by this. We're not uh, saving anyone from anything, are we? No, no, Corey, I 100% agree with you there. I, I can't understand. And, and it's probably even more is interesting or frustrating is that there's lots of examples around the world right now of, of governments just doing an absolutely abhorrent job of this. And, and we seem to be using that as a guide to how to make it worse. It, it's a bit like our, our COVID response, I suppose. We, we, we never balance the other side of the equation. Um, so we actually know the downside to human well-being and health and, and community well-being from, from reduction in wealth in the community, so from poverty, essentially. And, and that actually has all sorts of, um, you know, e economists know those impacts. We're not, we're not measuring that. Um, we have to fundamentally understand that by making our society more expensive, then that is actually bad. So I think it's about time we started looking at the net benefits of these things. Um, and, and, you know, I suppose probably took a chill pill on the catastrophe stuff, because let's face it, these experts, catastrophists, get very little right. So you know, at what point do we stop calling them experts when it comes to the, uh, the, the downside of, of their view of carbon dioxide? Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. And I'm going to presume that when you look at investing in a company or you're running your own company and making decisions, you are going to do a cost-benefit analysis attached to the expenditure and, and what are the future revenues going to come through. I can tell you, government just doesn't do that. They just make decisions. Uh, to hell with the consequences. Let's hope it, it comes up trumps. And I, I guess 
that lack of prudence has led us to this disastrous position now. How would you respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, look, I'll go one step further. You know, I've got the best job in the world. I invest in young people, typically young people. Uh, we prefer young people, to be honest. And then it's our job to, to peer behind their pitch, to look at the data, uh, analyse what they're saying, understand the markets, understand the unit economics and all these sort of lovely uh, terms that we use. So we fundamentally then don't believe them. So w when I come up with a lot of the positions I do in public, it's because I know how to research. Uh, I, I don't like... Um, I, I don't like the philosophy of if I just listen to the experts. They're experts, you're not. Well, that's a load of rot. Uh, they probably are expert at something, but we can all analyse data, understand data, understand people's, um, uh, how they're conflicted in some of these equations as well. The positions I've arrived at aren't because of some blind, illogical whatever. It's because when you look at the data behind this, you understand that there's, there's something, um, a lot more going on. Um, and, and literally, it's, 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 it's really the, uh, I, I suppose, the sign of the times that, that certain positions are easier with a soundbite and a one-line sort of throwaway and they seem to be hard to fight against in, in what is mostly an exceptionally left-biased media. But it's not just economics, Steve, that, that you're into and business. I mean, you opened this interview by talking about having three daughters and you want to, you know, you don't want to engage in lies with them or you don't want them to engage in lies with the community either. The cultural sector has undergone an amazing change recently, relatively recently. Personally, I think it's been gripped by a, a collective insanity. Everyone's pretending the absurd is totally normal. Where do you think we're going to end up if we keep going down this path, which is really suspending common sense and the lived human history? We're going into dark, uncharted territory, aren't we? Well, I, I'm somewhat of an optimist there. I see wisps of reality shining through at times, and I, I deeply care for my family. I deeply care for this country. I carried a rifle for it for almost nine years. So, um, and, and I think that you just don't give up on things. Uh, kids or country or anything else, and especially just it starts with the truth. If we can't, if we can't do the truth, then we're in a lot of trouble. So m most of the fights are online when it comes down to this sort of stuff, which is sort of funny because you're arguing about, you know, Cat Lover 96 on, 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 on Twitter, for example, who lives in his mum's basement and has no real face. So they are essentially cowards. Um, and so they're, they're also very good places to understand your point. So I've, I've, part of my approach is to roll these verbal hand grenades into these conversations to understand my point. Am I wrong? Do people actually have a counter for me? And, and you know you've won when the counter's nothing but insults. So, look, these... I encourage more people to participate, do, do it with politeness, until they're not polite. And then don't hold back, because the, the left and the other side are taking such an aggressive position here. We, it, it, to some point, if they do that, we can't fight nice back. So, you know, let's just... You know, if, if they want to bring it, we should bring it back as well. In a verbal sense, in a debate sense, is obviously what I'm saying there. Yeah, you've got to stand up for yourself and, you know, give them a dose of their own medicine on occasions. Words after my own heart, mm. uh, Steve Baxter. Thanks so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Cheers, Corey. Thanks very much.